Hey folks, this is Mark Joyner. We're going to get started here in about five minutes. You should see a little uh, box below the video here that says uh, it's a little input box where you guys can ask questions. Please use that uh, because uh, that is the only way you're going to be able to ask uh, Spike and myself questions live in real time. Anyway, with that said, guys, we're uh, about four minutes out here. So uh, grab your beverage of choice, get your questions loaded. And I see Spike there hanging out in the virtual green room waving at us. <laughs> we're, uh, we're all locked and cocked and uh, ready to go here. And we will see you guys uh, in about four minutes. Okay, everybody, this is Mark Joyner. We're about three minutes out. And I uh, just want to remind everybody here, you should see a little box there. It says, talk to Mark. That's actually your chance to talk to Mark and Spike both. I will be facilitating this uh, wonderful event here. Uh, but you guys can submit your questions there. If we don't have questions from you, we will not be able to answer your questions. How about that? Can't escape that logic. Um, Meanwhile, uh, Spike and I will, will think of brilliant things to say to you, regardless whether you have questions or not. But uh, we will see you in about uh, two minutes. And I hope we have plenty of questions from you guys, because I tell you what, if I had just one opportunity to speak to Spike humor, and thank goodness I don't, he's such a good friend of mine, I can talk to Spike all the time. But if I had but one opportunity, I would ask so many questions. So if you all don't ask questions, you're making a big 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 fat mistake i tell you because this man is a genius he has a tremendous tremendous experience a tremendous breadth of knowledge and is a wonderful wonderful human being on top of all that you do not have a better opportunity than this to get your business questions answered by just about anybody so please ask those questions folks we are very very eager to answer them with that said i will see you guys in two minutes we will get started promptly Okay, folks, it is exactly 10 a.m. my time. That means it is 9 p.m. Eastern time, which also means it is time for us to begin this wonderful thing. This is Mark Joyner. I'm the founder and CEO of Simpleology, among other things that you are probably aware of if you are on this call, I imagine. Uh, and I have with me none other than Spike Humor. And if you are on this call, you also know who he is because that means that you guys bought this wonderful package that we put together compiling 1,000 years of business wisdom into one tidy package for you guys. And uh, we thank you guys for participating in that campaign. It was a lot of fun. We did that 
as a live demonstration for the guys who are in a, a program I put together called Cash Injection Bootcamp because I wanted to show these guys how easy it is to create info products out of thin air and on the fly. Now, with that said, Spike, welcome. Thanks, well, how are you? I'm doing fantastic, thank you. Always better when I see you. Yeah, you as well, man, you as well. All right. Well, we have we have one question in so far. It looks like uh, we got folks filtering in now. Um, I see the count going up there um, as we go. But for everybody just coming in below the video uh, on the link that you were given, that was simpleology.com forward slash Mark and Spike. And it probably redirected to something that looks like get.simpleology.com slash something, something, something. And you should see a video there, uh, the video that you're watching, I hope. And, uh, and then a little box there, it says, talk to Mark. That is where you can submit your questions, guys. And we are here to answer your questions. That is the entire raison d'etre of our little soiree today. All right. So uh, I got some hellos coming in. Hellos are great. Thank you guys for all that. And I, uh, thank you for the kind words. We want more questions. I have one question. We're going to start with this. Mr. Dave here says, what process do you guys go through to vet new business ideas and to execute the necessary action steps to bring them to market? Now, that is a damn good question. That and I, I will let Spike start with that. You know, I, and, and it is a great question, Mark. And, I, and I, 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 for me, and I'll speak from you know, first from personal experience and then from um, client and, and professional experience. You know, I think the biggest thing is, number one, having a criteria of what it is that you say yes to and what it is that you say no to, right? Because... Mm. You know, as entrepreneurs and as business owners and as, as people that, um, you know, see opportunities pretty much around every avenue, if you don't have the ability to really assess something from a, from a criteria standpoint that fits for you, fits from a strategy standpoint, from a vision standpoint, it's really easy to get diverted. And so for me, number one, I, I, if I'm working with a client, I say, okay, you know, what is it that they're trying to do? Are they clear about it? Is it viable? Is it practical? Do they have the ability either to access the market or bring the market to or bring the product to bear? But in addition to that, do they have the discipline to stick to whatever path that they choose, not to the exclusion of everything else, but as the as kind of the guide marker for them as they're going down the path to pursue to whatever it is that they're trying to accomplish? I think that's uh, very sage wisdom, of course. Um, you know, this is something that I echo time and time again. Uh, you know, I'm always telling folks the origin story of Simpleology, you know, and that's that, you know, when I was closing up uh, the businesses I was running at the time, I was doing a lot of consulting behind the scenes for folks and they were all coming to me uh, looking for marketing wisdom, but what they really needed was to get their productivity squared away. And one of the ways to do that is to get clarity on what you're doing. In fact, it's not just one of the ways, it's it's an essential first step because <laughs> if you're not clear on what it is that you got to do and, and uh, where you're headed, um, productivity is meaningless. And this, by the way, is why most of the productivity platforms out there uh, that, uh, that that I saw before we created Simpleology, um, uh, you know, I thought were inadequate. They don't talk about the context of your focus. You know, they might deal with how to deconflict your tasks and things like that, but they but they never ask you, where are you headed? <laughs> right. right. And then, well, you know, the, the other thing, if I could add, Mark, and this is really kind of the second point, I think, for me personally, but also uh, for people that I work with that, that are probably most successful over time. And mm -hmm. that is, you know, when, when you evaluate an opportunity that fits into your criteria, all things being equal, which one of those opportunities will allow you to leverage what it is that you've already done, what it is that you were already doing on an ongoing basis, who it is that you know, or what it is that you can do that brings more value to you and the other people that are involved. And again, this kind of goes back to the, to the simpleology thing that you talk about. I mean, not only is it about making simple, making it simple, it's about making it strategic so that you don't have slippage and you don't have breakage by doing the wrong things at the wrong time for the wrong people. Mm, absolutely. That's totally right on. And, you know, I'll, I'll bring another way to, to talk about that, which I think is, is quite analogous to what you're uh, talking about. And by the way, I just want to remind everybody, all the new folks coming in there, uh, below the video, you should see a box there. It says, talk to Mark, submit your questions there. Um, that is the only way we are going to get your questions, guys. So I very much look forward to uh, to hearing those. Um, that That is the, the purpose of the call is to answer the questions that you guys have. So um, if you don't ask questions, Spike and I are just going to, we're, we're just going to give you random wisdom and, and it'll be good. I promise that, <laughs> but it'll be random. It would be much better if it were answering specific challenges that you have. Let me, let me talk about looking at this a slightly different way. And that's, um, you know, this is quite analogous to the, the, uh, the intellectual pedigree 
that started the whole lean startup movement. You know, there were guys before that in Silicon Valley, uh, it, you know, that, that did the real uh, intellectual heavy lifting and, and they created a template on, on how to create a startup. And they ask you questions like, uh, you, you know, who is the audience? And how are you going to connect with that audience? And I think that that is a, a, a supremely important question because a lot of guys, they just start out with a random good idea. You know, they, they see a problem often that they have and then they solve that problem. And that's great. It, it's it, There's certainly nothing wrong with thinking like that. And in fact, some, you know, fantastically huge businesses got started but with by a guy who did no market research, but solved the problem for himself. But it's more reliable if you validate the existence of the market first, right? And then you have to ask yourself certain questions about that market. Uh, you know, is it a, uh, you know, what what I used to call a thirsty crowd. And then I found out later after I met Gary Halbert, he talked about the same thing. He called it a starving crowd, right? You know, this it, we're talking about the same thing more or less. And a lot of uh, business scholars out there uh, say the same kind of thing. You know, they say that you need an audience. Uh, I remember Joshua Shafran um, calls it an aholic audience. You know, you got your alcoholics, you got your collectaholics, <laughs> you know, like that. I think that's very important. But then you, you need to go in there and you need to make sure that you have a way of contacting those people that's valid. So, you know, once you identify that a market exists, do you have a valid way of doing it? And this sort of ties into some of the stuff that Spike was talking about you know, uh, tapping into your existing asset base. So for me, I'm a, a huge fan of, uh, you know, what I call integration marketing. Um, so much of a fan uh, of it that I wrote a book of the same title and the, uh, the, the methodology is super powerful. You know, it's, it's finding existing traffic and transaction streams that are speaking to that same audience and then injecting your unit of marketing value, be it an offer or what have you, into that traffic stream or transaction stream. And this opens up an infinite realm of possibilities for you to tap into warm markets that already exist. And what's beautiful about that is that you don't have to spend the money on customer acquisition. You don't make any risk when you do this unless you're actually acquiring a customer. And this subsequently is how Microsoft built uh, what was up until very recently, the, the largest fortune in the history of the world, um, unless you count some of the, you know, some of the family money, you know, that that's a whole other topic. But uh, the, 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 the thing that's really important to remember here is that acquiring customers, uh, this is a, a marketing saw, um, I don't know uh, of anybody that has validated this uh, scientifically, but it's something I've certainly seen uh, repeated over and over and over again. And that's that the cost of acquisition for a new customer is about 10x of what it costs to sell something to an existing customer. So if you can get customers handed to you on a silver platter, if you can tap into an exist, existing customer base that you already have yourself, so much the better. This is you know, one of the shortcuts for growing businesses. And by the way, it's not just a shortcut in terms of time, it's also a shortcut in terms of capital because you're gonna get money a lot faster. And then the last thing I would say is, um, do you have a big idea with which to present the product that you have to that market. Um, now this is hearkening back to the great Eugene Schwartz and Breakthrough Advertising. I think one of the most important books ever written about marketing, almost certainly the best copywriting book uh, ever written. Um, not the easiest book to, to get through. It took me about four or five reads before I finally uh, understood how profound that book was. But once I did, I realized, okay, I got to read this about twice a year. And I do. And one of the things he talks about um, is the notion of, of having a big idea that you present to your uh, consumer, but it has to be along what he calls the, uh, you know, the awareness scale, right? And so if you're the, the pitch that you're making to that person. And, and a lot of these guys now talk about the, the lead of the ad. In fact, there was an informal sequel to Breakthrough Advertising called Great Leads by some of the great folks at Agora, which is a fantastic, fantastic book. And it gives you a whole uh, arsenal of ways to connect what it is you have with the market. And this is what Eugene Schwartz talks about. And the way that he, he uh, hypothetically presents that to you is to understand the awareness level of that market that you're speaking to and then find the right lead to connect on that correct awareness level. And that's when the real magic happens. Cause I'll give you an example. So let's imagine that, uh, you know, you've got a guy who doesn't know anything about Apple. 
he's never heard of Apple. He, you know, he, he's been living in, uh, uh, you know, a mud hut un until yesterday. He doesn't even know what a cell phone is. And you send him an email. It's his first email. And it says, hey, 50% off on all Apple products. Now that ad is not going to work for that guy because his awareness level is, I don't even know what a cell phone is. He's not even problem aware over here. But then you got all these guys over here that are brand aware and they're going to jump like crazy on that Apple, uh, you know, 50% off ad because they are brand aware. They, they love Apple. So these are the kinds of things that I think about when I, uh, when I validate a market spike, anything you want to add to that? Yeah. You know, a couple of things, Mark, I mean, you know, and I believe that you're right. And I'm, and I'm saying this not just as, as a speculation, but in my experience of working with a lot of businesses for a long time, you know, that number one, the cost of acquisition for a client generally is not only the most expensive, but it's also uh, the longest and most, one of the, one of the most resource intense uh, activities that you have inside of a business, right? So if you can, if you can shortcut that either from a cost standpoint, time standpoint, or a reliability standpoint, number one, it makes you more profitable. But, but, but also I think a lot of times businesses miss the fact that they're trying to sell a solution or, or offer an opportunity um, to uh, people because that's what they see as the opportunity. Or that's what, the, you know, that's what their taste is. I mean, I can't tell you the number of businesses that when I talk to them, oh, this is really cool. I love this. This is great. Well, you know what? Feed a fish what a fish likes to eat, not what you like to eat, right? And so being able to, number one, uh, access that. Number two, being able to, to recognize what it is that people want, what it is that they need for their own benefit and being able to provide that. But, but in addition to that, recognizing that as a business owner, that, that, that people don't exist in isolation, right? Just because they have one want, one need, one desire, doesn't mean that there aren't other things that, that they want, that they, they would love to tap into. And if you can find you know, people who offer products or services that would be synergistic with yours or solves a problem either before or after um, they purchase that other product or service, and you can plug into that, now not only do you have a, a, a ready buyer, not only do you have somebody that you have access to and, and who's done a transaction with someone that you know has some degree of credibility with them, but also you have the ability to, to think about what it is that the next step is to make their life better, make their business better, or whatever it is that they need. And being able to pro, you know program that in, not just from a strategy standpoint, but also from a sequence standpoint, really allows you to bring um, you know additional value at a higher level. Awesome. Yeah, yeah I, I, there, I got nothing to add to that. <laughs> That's totally right on. Let's move on to some new questions. We got some new ones rolling in. So everybody just coming in now. Guys, if you look below the video, there's a little box there. It says, Ask Mark. Post your questions there. I appreciate all the well wishes and kind words there. Um, thank you guys for that. What I really want to see from you are questions though, guys. We've got some good ones coming in here. I want to see a lot more. I, I always love to see tons of questions coming in and I like to have more than I can answer. And I like to endeavor to answer as many of them as I possibly can. That just makes me feel better uh, about doing these live Q and A's. Um, let's move on to this next one here. So we've got one from, all right, see some good questions coming in now. All right. So Dan says, uh, Hey, Mark and Spike, do you recommend doing a traffic swap with your biggest competitor? <laughs> well, from my standpoint, the answer is a definite maybe, right? Um, <laughs> Good answer. You know, you know, because because I you know I look at things like that because that's a big decision, but but I think it's important to to look at it from not just the transactional value but also the strategic value, and that is what what is it that you would like to accomplish over time, not just for that single transaction. Like for instance, you could do a traffic swap with your base competitor, and now all of a sudden they ate your lunch, right? You know, you've been able to offer a product on a, or a service on a one-time transaction, and guess what? Now they have your database or vice versa. So I think for me, you know, the question comes down to is that not only what does it allow me to do from an opportunistic uh, level, but what does it allow me to do from a strategic level and how can it advance not just um, that single transaction, but how can it advance my, my business over time? And I think if you ask that question and if you can answer that question, the, the answer becomes obvious, right? Whether it's a yes or no. I think that's totally right on. And just to sort of uh, underscore that, I would say uh, for me, I was asked, can I trust this person, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, whether or not I can trust them is going to determine whether or not, you know, I think they're going to attempt to eat my lunch later. Because, um, right. you know, even if I feel confident uh, competitively, I, it, it's, you know, that's extra drama that I don't need. Right? Yeah. I don't need to create that for myself. And the other one is, let's just say it's, uh, you know, it's a real clean transaction. You know, there, there's no clear way that they're, I mean, they're a competitor, but it's not such a clear difference, you know, where let's say, for example, uh, you know, you're, you're both selling fuel injectors and, and the competitors fuel injectors are clearly better at a better price, you know, with, with more reliability and it's demonstrable and they've got better marketing. Um, 
yeah, maybe not such a good idea, <laughs> right? But I was just going to say, you know, if, if it's a guy who's, you know, slightly analogous, then, I mean, you don't really have to worry about that that much because, you know, there, there's, there's not enough crossover there to really worry about the competition. But I'd be worrying about whether or not I can trust that guy because I don't want to send my customers over to somebody who's not going to take care of them. And if I can't trust them, I don't think they're going to take care of them. Yeah, well, and, and, and I agree, Mark. I mean, first, you know, I, if, if I don't feel that I can trust someone and, you know, it doesn't always work the way you hope, but if right. I don't feel I can trust someone, I don't, I don't do business with them because if I don't, if I don't feel that I can um, enter into a transaction, I'm certainly not going to enter into a relationship that I trust. But, but, but on top of that, I think sometimes, you know, when we, when we look at people or we look at businesses, we see them as competitors. And it's not that they're necessarily competitors. It's, it's that we haven't refined or defined what it is that we do or our value proposition mm -hmm. clearly enough. Right, because we can we can fill in some of the gaps that number one they may not. Right, you're talking about the fuel injectors, and maybe they're maybe they're a low end, high volume, uh, inexpensive, um, you know, fuel injector. And maybe I'm a high end, high performance specialty injector. Right, so there are going to be people that are in that database or in that uh, prospect base that they may not be serving. That if I if I look at the fact that we're only doing fuel injectors, I see that person as a competitor. If I see myself as a high performance and um, fuel injector provider. Uh, I see that person differently than than I would if I would see them just you know doing the same thing. Beautiful distinction, and and I I'll go so far as to say is that most of the time, uh, that that kind of competition that you need to worry about isn't there, <laughs> you know, because usually the benefit that you get from getting it uh, exposed to another uh, audience is is just so enormous that it it outweighs. Uh, you know, any uh, potential competitive ding that you might get. And again, I mean, you know, what Spike is bringing up that, you know, such a, a wonderful nuance there, even guys who are selling the same thing, fuel injectors, if they are serving different segments of that same market, they're not really competitive, right. ultimately. Beautiful. Yeah, I mean, I mean you, know, you know, look at Amazon, I mean, and obviously they're, they're pervasive now and uh, ubiquitous in terms of what they provide, but but you know, when, when they got into the book business, they weren't looking at authors as being competitive with one another, right? Just because I bought this book didn't mean that I wouldn't buy another book. And and I think being able to, to articulate that, refine that, not only to your marketplace, but also for yourself is key to not only in, in a transaction like that, but being successful in business. It allows you to step above and, and rather than being just a commodity that's kind of lumped in with everybody else, allows you to carve out a niche and carve out a message and carve out a value proposition that, every, not, that not everyone would see had you not done that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let's move on to this next question here. Uh, so Chris asks, what are some first steps if you two guys had to start over from scratch with limited funds? How would you develop everything from mindset to new income streams to feed your family and start down the road toward a new legacy? That's a damn good question too. That it is. You want to go first or would you like me to go? Uh, you go ahead, sir. All right, well, you know, I, I, think, I think, you know, part of it for me, you know, and I'm speaking from my personal experience, um, you know, I, when, when I went into business, number one, um, I wasn't as confident about what it is that I was bringing to the table because I hadn't really fully thought about it from the perspective of my market or from my prospects or from my, you know, or from my buyers. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, so what I was doing is that I was selling rather than sharing and I was, and I was selling rather than, than being excited about what it is that I was bringing to the table. So number one, I think being very, very clear about what it is that you do and how it benefits someone else. Because, you know, so many times I see people that, that they put their hand out, right? They, they knock on the door with their hand out, say, please give me, please give me, please give me, will you do this, will you do this, will you do this? <laughs> and, and I think, it, you know, it's, it's much easier to knock on the door with your hands full saying, hey, look, I'm so excited about what it is that I do and what it is that I can bring to you. I can't help but share it to you. And I would be, for myself, I'd be doing you a disservice had I not, had I not offered this to you, right? It's a whole different mindset in terms of business and, and feeling that you have an market as opposed to just going out trying to make a living. Yeah, yeah, I think you totally nailed that. Let me give you a few other thoughts on that as well. Um, so, you, you know, we asked about, uh, uh, you know, doing this uh, from a mindset perspective. And, you know, the first thing that I would say is, um, you know, you've, you've got to probably extract yourself as much as you can away from friends, family, any influence out there that, that is going to be telling you that you can't do this because most people are going to tell you that you can't. And guess what? Statistically, they're right. <laughs> Statistically, they're right. Most businesses fail. So it's not that they're out there, that they're out to get you. Sometimes they are. <laughs> Sometimes there is some, you know, ill-intentioned advice out there telling you, Ooh, maybe you shouldn't do that. But a lot of it is very well-intentioned advice uh, designed to prevent us 
from experiencing suffering. And they tell us, don't go do this new venture, go find a day job, you know, or whatever it is that they're, they're going to advise you to do. Um, and for most, for most folks, that is in fact the, the right advice, but I'm assuming that you you really want to make a serious go of entrepreneurship and uh, it, you know, you, you uh, want to let the chips far, fall where they may. And you know, you want to see whether or not it's going to happen. Um, then uh, you, you've got to get yourself away from those types of voices because they're, they're effective. They're convincing. They will change the way you see the world if you let them. And you, you can't do that. And this is one of the things that a lot of folks don't talk about in business is that there is a, a very serious emotional toll <laughs> in running a business. There are emotional costs. You've got to be uh, willing to pay that price. It means you've got to sacrifice certain things. There, there are going to be social events that you will not be able to go to. Um, you know, there will be friends that you will lose um, for any number of reasons. There are going to be people who aren't going to agree with the way you do business or the product that you're selling. There's so many things that are going to come up. Um, and if you don't, if you can't pass those tests, you're going to fail. Even if you get everything else right, if you don't get that, that you know, mental side correct. Now, with all that said, um, you know, if you go back to what Spike and I were talking about earlier, that kind of gives you the golden keys for making sure that these things, uh, you know, get started correctly, right? You know, if you're doing integration marketing, you're going to have a way better chance of succeeding in the early days of your business than if you had to, to go out there and validate your business with paid advertising. Now, I'll give you a caveat on that. Your integration marketing is going to be way more effective if you can validate it with paid advertising first. But here's the thing. Here's the beautiful, beautiful thing about the, the day and age in which we live right now. It does not cost you a lot of money to validate a market anymore. It used to cost you thousands upon thousands upon thousands of dollars to roll something out, even to the smallest segment of a, a direct mail list, right? Because you had to pay for the printing and then you had to pay for, for the list itself and the mailing and all these different things. And you didn't know whether or not it was going to work. And you, you know, you, you might be waking up to uh, an, an empty mailbox, but now we have this wonderful thing where you can post an ad on Facebook or YouTube or, or Google or wherever, and it can be live within minutes. And you can know within a matter of hours whether or not a particular offer is yeah. going to work. And that's the kind of thing that I would be thinking about early on. Yeah, you know, and Mark, I mean, and, and, and you know, this was the, um, you actually said it um, very concisely, but I'm also like inserting something in that. And that is, you know, from a personal standpoint, I know where I went wrong. But when I work with businesses, um, I can tell you where, where most businesses get into trouble. It's not just the start, right? And you're right. I mean, you have you have a lot of voices. You have a lot of people that sometimes are well-intentioned. Sometimes they're jealous. Sometimes they just, you know, they yeah. want to the crap on you, right? Yeah. Uh, and, uh, but, but, but what happens a lot of times, you know, and you're, you're talking about validating, you're talking about testing. A lot of times what happens with businesses, and it's better and it's easier in many cases, especially now, like you said, you can validate something with a, with a, with a marketing test based on certain metrics. A lot of times when people go into business, they don't have metrics of, of success. They right? mm. generally don't get into trouble overnight. They get into trouble over time. And it's because <laughs> they're not clear about what it is that they want to do. And so they yeah. don't want to off course. But but also, they don't they don't make the small adjustments that are necessary. right? It's like if I had $100,000 create a marketing campaign and I threw it all into one bucket and it didn't work, well, guess what? I'm out of, I'm out of $100,000. But if I did a if I did a marketing test and I did something on an incremental basis and I knew exactly what it is that I was trying to get out of that, not only do I, do I have a, a baseline or a control that I can test against, I also have the ability to measure it over time so that if something changes in the market, something changes with delivery, something changes with um, you know the, the response, I have the ability to make an adjustment before I get to the four hundred thousand dollars and it's too late, right? Or it's certainly more difficult. And so being able to say, okay, these are the things that drive my business, these are the things that create profit. These are the things that strategically advance my business. These are the things that create value in my marketplace. And then if I have that um, as, a, as a measurable metric in my business, I can say, is my business doing better today than it was yesterday? Mm. Is, it better do, you know, is it better doing tomorrow? And then you have the ability then to make the adjustments so that you don't get into a hole and, and have to dig yourself out later on. Very nice. Very nice. Okay. Moving on to uh, another question here. we got some real good ones rolling in now. Thank you guys for all those. Um, Charles asks, I'm in a business that necessitates building trust and rapport, meaningful relationships with business owners. A challenge I'm having is missing the sales mark, meaning I build the trust, but miss the sale akin to a man prospecting a woman and missing the relationship mark and finding themselves in a friend status. <laughs> he finds himself in the friend zone with sales. All right. So what would you recommend? 
I do to build trust and stay on track of the end goal, which is subscribing them to my company's service? That is a damn good question as well, sir. What would you say? Well, you know, I think a couple of things. I mean, one is sometimes people confuse uh, attention um, with interest and interest with um, interest with trust, right? And mm. I think there's things, they're the same things. And sometimes there's a sequence. And sometimes what happens is that we think that because we have someone's attention that we have their interest, and because we have their interest that we have their trust. And so sometimes, you know, you have to be able to make sure that you take it the whole way through the cycle, right? And using the, you know, the, the analogy of, of uh, you know, the friend zone, um, you know, certainly people can have, can have attention, they can have interest, and they can even trust you as a friend. But, but if you know their criteria in terms of what it is that trust means to them in order for them to enter into a transactional relationship with you, that may be different than just saying, hey, you know what, I love you, I believe what you're doing, it's great stuff, but you know what, I'm not ready to buy. And so by being able to figure out, number one, what that is, and sometimes it's a question of asking, right? You know, ask the people that don't buy or ask the people that did buy what it is that caused them to, you know, what was the decision point? What was the trigger? What was the, what was the thing that made the most difference for them either to buy or not to buy? And then when you find those things out, you're not, you're not making assumptions. Really what you're doing is that you're doing research and then you're able to modify what it is that you do and hopefully you have a higher conversion. Yeah, really beautifully said. And uh, just to underscore that a little bit as well, um, you know, even if you're talking to the right prospect, you know, in a, in a general sense, he may not be in the, the, the right point in his business cycle to buy, right? He may not be the precise decision maker. There could be, you know, any number of reasons why he may not be right. So, you know, what, uh, Charles is doing here is something that a lot, I see a lot of business owners do, you know, they go out there and they see a, you know, a, a potential prospect and they invest a lot of energy in building up that trust and rapport. And they don't even know whether or not this guy is actually qualified, you right. know? And so there, there's nothing wrong with going in there and qualifying someone, you know, and it takes a certain amount of finesse to do that while you maintain the rapport. You don't want to come in there and be the guy with the, okay, well, do you, do you have this and do you have this and, and be cold and, and, uh, and unfriendly? No, you don't want to do that. You, you know, you want to kind of, you know, ease it into the conversation and say, Hey, look, man, you seem like a great kind of guy. I would love to know regardless, but let's find out whether or not we can do business. Okay. And, and, uh, you know, and, and, if, if that, if we can, great. If not, you know, we can remain friends and I'm sure we can help each other in other ways too, but, but let's, let's find this out, you know, and you don't have to be a jerk about it. You know, I mean, it can, it can be fun and it can be direct. It can be totally direct like that. Yeah. It's all in the, the tonality and the attitude that you have when you bring it out. Yeah. And, and, and Mark, and I, and I think, you know, it's a wonderful point because mutual self-interest is probably the greatest motivator out there in terms of, in, in terms of getting people to collaborate and cooperate. Right. Mm. If I know that I'm going to get what I want while you get what you want, not only am I motivated for myself, I'm also motivated for you because it helps me get more of what it is that I want. And so, you know, so by, you know, qualifying people, number one, knowing are they really truly ready to buy? Number two, are they right for it? But also being able to, you know, have the discipline or have the, the forthrightness to say, you know what, this isn't a good fit. And, you know, so many times, I mean, and, I, and, I, and I'm not saying this um, disparagingly, but sometimes, you know, I see this when people get into network marketing, right? They say everybody's a prospect. Right. So, you know, so you, so you talk to your friends, you talk to your family, you talk to your neighbors. And eventually what happens if you burn a lot of people out, you burn yourself out, because what you're doing is that you're talking to people based on proximity, not based on, you know, the, the opportunity. And so, um, you know, getting trust is easier uh, with somebody who not only is, is, is aware of what it is that you do, but, but also has the need from a timing standpoint, from a wear and fall standpoint, whether it be money or whether it be um uh, proximity or whatever it happens to be. So, so having that criteria, I think is probably, probably the best, you know, the best advice that, 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 uh, that you gave and probably the best advice to the answer. Awesome. And one other thing I would add to that is that let's say you've qualified a guy completely and then, you know, you, you build rapport with him, but then what you don't have is like what you were talking about earlier, you know, you, you may not have interest, right? You may not have desire. So how do you, how do you, uh, build that? And I got asked that question yesterday and, um, in a, a cash injection boot camp, and I really, really love that question because I, you know I think that it is present on uh, the minds of almost everyone in, in sales and marketing, but very, very few people ask that. How do you actually build desire? And and there are some very good hypotheses about how this is done. Um, 
you know, Eugene Schwartz and uh, uh, Moynes, and I can't remember the other author, but the guys who wrote Un Unlimited Selling Power both have very, very similar answers to this, right. one from the perspective of copywriting and one from the perspective of sales. They're very closely related, by the way, right. the, the, the psychology of it. And the answer that both of them give, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the languaging that both of them use. So Eugene Schwartz says that you are the architect of your prospects dreams you're the you know you are the architect of their future so you need to paint a a vivid emotionally evocative picture of what that future will look like with your product or service and moines and i again i can't remember the other author's name but the guys wrote on limited selling power they said something very similar you know they said that the re the key way to build that desire is to use that evocative language to to paint pictures yeah. right to to get them to go into their own imagination and imagine what their life would be like with this product and what it would be like without it right and if you can get them to imagine those two things and to really really feel that that's the thing that really kind of you know tips the scales because you could have a, a you could have a totally qualified guy and a, a beautiful logical argument right but if the guy doesn't feel it on an emotional level that this is something that he really he needs and again you've probably heard this many times before you know we uh you know people make decisions emotionally and they justify them with logic right um it, you know we can say this over and over and over again but unless you really really know how to create that emotional desire it doesn't mean much no, and, and Mark, I don't know how deep you want to go into this, so I'll just, I'll just touch on it lightly. But, you know, generally, it's easier to get people to um, step into that picture that you're creating if you start with a level of abstraction and then go to specificity. Let me mm. give you, you know, if I was speaking to a room of a thousand people, and if I said, you know what, I bet every single one of you in here have a, have a need and have a desire that has not yet been met. And deep down inside, you know exactly what it is that you, that you want, what it is that you need that will make all the difference in your life and your business, right? And everybody in the room is going to sit there and they're going to nod their head. Now, they don't know whether I'm selling cars or whether I'm selling candy bars, right? But 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 at some point in time, in order to go from that that point of desire, that point of uh, attention or awareness and get it, get it into a transaction, I have to take it down to something that actually ties into that, that future projection, that future pacing, right? Now, I can future pace say, okay, your life is going to be better after you do this. But if I can't tie that back to a specific value or something that it is that's a specific need, the bottom line is people get really, really excited. They get really, really interested and they don't enter into a transaction. Beautiful, beautiful. Now we could have a whole call just on that discussion right there because that is a very, very deep topic, but I think that's a, a really good launching pad you given folks here. All right, we have plenty of questions now and this is great. This is the kind of situation I like to be in. But folks, if you have more, go ahead and pop them in below the video where it says, uh, talk to Mark and I will see those questions. And that is where I am getting these questions. We're getting them in live in real time now. James asks, will this call be recorded? Yes, it will, sir. Um, but guys, stay on it live. It's going to be a lot more exciting live, and, and I can't answer your questions in the recording, of course, right? So at, post your questions. Now, James has a rather long question here. I, I will uh, attempt to, to read through this as quickly as I can. Um, what would be your recommendations to grow a B2B machine and test equipment safety uh, guarding uh, uh, B2B mach oh, machine and test equipment safety guarding business that at this point uh, in time is part-time. Uh, I'm in the process of setting up a meeting with the person that is in charge of all the products in the U.S. to see if they need an installer and fabricator for their product. Right now, I work for a distributor of their line that also represents multiple other products for the manufacturing industry. Selling the products that I install uh, is just a small part of their focus. I will find out if there is opportunity to go direct to the customer outside of the company's territory that I deal with now. My goal is to grow the business, to have a crew that installs. Uh, I will oversee the business. Um, okay, I want to build the business to eventually sell. Um, I know that was a lot of info, Spike. Did, did you follow that? Yeah, I, th I think so. I mean, I, th I think there are a couple aspects. I mean, one, if you're, if you're doing it for a business that you already work um, and you have to figure out a way to uh, make, make sure that, number one, they don't see it as competitive or distracting in terms of what it is that they do. So that if you want to go beyond their territory and you know, figure out a way to kind of align them with that. The second thing that I do, and this is not necessarily specific or isolated to the particular example, but sometimes what happens is that when people go into business like this, especially if you're selling to corporations, I think sometimes they will spend their time um, talking to the wrong person inside of an organization. One person may be the person who actually signs a check, but somebody else might be the person that approves it. So make sure that you have the ability to access those people. But, but, but with that, when you talk about the metrics and, and building a business to sell, um, you, you know, you know ha having the right metrics in place, having the right tracking, 
but also make sure that it's something that's not predicated just on you know your relationships, your 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 charisma, your strategy. Being being able to have a system and a structure that if you went on vacation for three months, that if somebody decided to come in and run it, that the business would continue. Because I can't tell you the number of businesses that people thought, man, I got a great business, I can sell it, that they either got uh, a substantially lesser value than what they would have, or didn't sell it at all because it was predicated on a key man or key woman or key person that uh, didn't come with the business. And that's why a lot of times when businesses sell, there may be a contract for three, six months or a couple of years for that person to stay in. But if you want to build a business to sell, build it based on the system, build it, build it based on a, on, a, on a structure that somebody else could actually come manage and run the business. Beautifully said. And I'll uh, just uh, underscore that with one uh, a cultural reference. Uh, if you haven't seen the film, The Founder, uh, which is a fantastic film about Ray Kroc, uh, the, the man, not the founder of McDonald's, a lot of folks don't know, but the, the popularizer of McDonald's. Um, if you want to see how those types of relationships can go wrong and how to negotiate those things, uh, you know, from the, the perspective of a guy who doesn't actually own the product, right? Watch that film. Now, I'm not saying reproduce what Ray did, right? He, he did some shady things uh, to, to, the, to the McDonald brothers, sadly, uh, you know, to their, uh, to their great dismay. Um, you know, they, uh, they, they basically, uh, you know, took on a handshake. Well, anyway, I'm not going to spoil the, the, uh, the film. If you don't know the whole story, you, you got it. You got to watch this movie though. I, I think everybody alive in business needs to watch this. Um, anyway, uh, that will, will really drive home for you the, the kind of territory that you're operating in, because that kind of, of space when you don't actually own the product, there are just a thousand things that can go wrong with that. And you do have to be very, very careful. And it goes back to, you know, what Spike and I were saying about, you know, how much you can trust people as well. Let's go on to this next question here. So Adam asks a really interesting one and it, it uh, this can be taken a lot of ways, but I think I understand the context in, in which he means this. Um, they're slightly vague, but he says, what do you find most people don't ask that they should also, what do people often miss with the process? Mm. I assuming I'm assuming he's speaking about starting up a new business, uh, but well, uh, you know it, it, it is a broad question, um, and, and so I'll, I'll, but I'll try to give a specific answer. It may be the the right answer to the wrong question, or vice versa. <laughs> you know, I, I think number one, um, you know, when, when you go into a situation, what what most people should ask that they don't is, um, you know, whether it be a buyer or a prospect, is you know what's important to you about what. Right. You know, so if, if I'm going to a gym, what's important to you about coming to the gym or potentially one gym? Could it be weight loss? Could it be, you know, you, you want to you want to be more attractive. You want to feel better. You just had a heart attack. You know, you're trying to save your life and, and, and under, you know, understanding what it is that um, your market wants and what it is that you can do, because in many cases you can't do all things for all people. Um, you know, the second thing in terms of questions that you should ask yourself is that what are you willing to do in order to get X? Right. If you know what it is that you want to get. What is it that you're willing to do? Like you were saying earlier on, Mark, you know, like sometimes it means you know skipping a party or or you know maybe missing your favorite TV show or, or those types of things. You know, are you really truly willing you know to do what it takes in order to be successful? And if so, to what point? And and I think if, if people are clear about that, it's easier to persevere. And ultimately, you know, if, if you're if you're willing to persevere, um, you know, your chances of success go way up because most of the time when you first start a business, it's not a straight line to success, right? It's a zigzag. And and yep. so I. think you know, asking that question of yourself and asking that of, of, of the people that are around you, whether it be your family, your spouse, your friends, your partners, your employer, um, you know, whoever it is that you think that, number one, you either need their support or you at least need their their acceptance, you know, for what it is that you're doing is, is part of part of clarifying the process and part of being successful in the process. Beautiful answer. OK, moving on to a question here from Tony. He says, Mark and Spike, an honor to be listening in on this. Thank you for the kind words. He says, question regarding Jay Abraham's fondness for borrowing strategies and tactics that work in one industry and deploying it into a completely different industry. I love this idea and I'm wondering what are some of the industries that he borrows from most often? That is an interesting question. And yeah. um, there are some good examples. Uh, oh, are there some good examples that illustrate some unique industries that are good to keep an eye on innovation wise or for any other reason? Hmm. You know, it, it, it's a big question. I mean, you know, and, and I have to, you know, I have to say, I mean, and I give Jay credit for this. I mean, he was the guy who really kind of opened up my mind in terms of being able to, you know, to do the adoption of, of something that was commonly accepted over here 
and put it someplace where it was unique. I mean, and if you look back in the day when, when Jay first um, moved from being a copywriter and being a direct response marketer, what he was able to do was to take things that were fairly well known in the direct response marketing industry and make it accessible for entrepreneurs and small business owners in terms of how do you measure your marketing? How, do, you know, how, is, it, how is it that you set up a marketing test? How do you come up with a headline? How do you come up with a value proposition? So, so on a broad level, that was something that he was able to do. But, but you know, the thing that used to amaze me about Jay and still does when, when I see that he does it is that he not only has the ability to, to look at a particular industry, he's able to bring in all those kind of holographic um, examples of, of other companies that he worked with. And so I think, number one, as, a, you know, as someone who's starting out, being able to look at things with a curious mind. Number two, being a student of business and being a student of entrepreneurs. I mean, when I used to travel with Jay, you know, um, and, and I, you know, I'm pretty good at, at starting conversations with people, but Jay would be like the most inquisitive person you ever met with every person that he ever spoke with, right? I mean, it wasn't just, you know, about him and he wasn't saying, hey, I'm Jay Abraham, look at what I've done. You know, he'd say, okay, so what is it that you do? Well, hey, I'm a janitor. Okay, well, great. And so he would find out what it is that, you know, made that person excited when they were at work. What is it they didn't like about the job? If you met somebody who was in the, you know, in the clothing business, right? What is it, you know, what is it that you do differently? What is it that people ask for? And what is it that, that people say to you when they're happy? What is it that they say to you when they're unhappy? And, and, and being able to, to, number one, you know, identify those things, I think, is, gives you kind of that, that raw material. But, but the other thing, you know, I think really, you know, you know that looking at things that, that all businesses really have a few things that they need, right? They need a product or service. They, they need a, you know, a potential market. They need the ability to, to reach that market. They need to build, they need the ability to, to service and fulfill. If, if you can look at what people were doing in one industry in terms of what it is, you know, how they uh, deliver that value. And then you can look at another industry, whether it be your own or somebody else's, where they're not using that point of distribution, not using that point of service, they're not using that point of marketing, they're not using that, that, that sales process and saying, look, you know, if I were able to take this over here, which is fairly common, and put it over there uh, where, it's, uh, where it's uncommon, now I can have a big impact. I mean, you know, Mark, you, you and I spoke about, uh, and it was on the call, so I'm not sure if everybody listened to it, but the example that I used was, was Henry Ford. You know, people talk about Henry Ford being, you know, such a, you know, such an innovator in creating the assembly line. And really what he did is that he studied the slaughtering industry, which was the disassembly. You know, the yeah. disassembly. <laughs> you know I'm, I'm going to take a live camera and turn it into hamburger. And so by being able to look at things with a curious eye and saying, look, this is very common over here. And if I were able to take that application, either reverse engineer it, put it into a different application, or maybe modify it, right, and put it over here, now it becomes innovation, right? Optimization generally comes from studying the best practices in a particular industry. But if you can take that practice and put it into a new industry or a new application, now it becomes innovation. And you, in many cases, can dominate either that market or certainly the, the, the approach to that market. Beautiful. And uh, I don't want to add too much to that, but I'll add just a little bit here. Um, you know, this is another way that, uh, you know, I kind of discovered later on that, that Jay and I had such a similar thinking process. And I'm not sure if Jay does this, but uh, the way I look at it is, is when I learn things from other industries, I what I tr attempt to do is to extrapolate larger principles from that and then move that over and see if I can turn that into a universal. And that's how things like integration marketing were born. You know, I, I first learned about this from uh, Joe Sugarman explaining to me, you know, the very simple process of telephone upselling, um, mm -hmm. you know, when, when he was uh, pioneering the infomercial. Right. And then I, I, I started to see that principle and I, I realized, oh, man, that that's everywhere. And then and, and holy crap. In fact, that's how Microsoft got big. And oh, man, I can do all these things in my business now. And there's something magical that happens when you get to those larger principles because it kind of like it, it gives you a new set of eyes through which you can see things. And right. for me, this is where a lot of new opportunity comes from is by by seeing things in a new way. And the best way to see things in a new way is to see something else <laughs> from from an, un, an unrelated area. Well, Mark, if I, if I could just add one thing, and I promise I won't go sure. through this because I know I, I have a tendency sometimes to get a little long. But, you know, though, there's a there's a – you know, there's a two two aspects of thinking, right? You have you have um, deductive thinking where you take the big picture and you kind of chunk it down, right? You have yep. deductive thinking where you take the small example and you kind of extrapolate it. And and you know, and most of us kind of go back and forth with that. But I but I tell you where 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 real genius comes from in many cases, and, and you touched on it. And I think there's actually a formula that you probably could model for this and, and articulate <laughs> anyone. And that is, you know, when you have the ability to um, inductively think from an example into a broader picture and then move it over slightly and then be deductive again and coming over to an industry or a market or something else that's just slightly different from where you started, 
that's really where that's really where the opportunity lies, right? And most people, what happens when they go from the small from the small piece to the big big picture, they either get lost and they can't get back down, or they start at the big picture and they can't get into a specific application. So there is a formula and there is a process there that I haven't been able to articulate or refine, but I bet you could. Well, God, I, I want to talk to you just about that. <laughs> See if we can do that because that would definitely be a worthwhile thing to deconstruct and to codify. Let's move on to another question here from Tony. So the, the same Tony asks another one, which is also a good question. He says, I see that building a unique selling proposition is an area that Spike has expertise. Does he have a particular process or methodology for creating a powerful USP? And to follow up, how would you recommend creating a USP in an industry that is hyper-competitive, overserved, and becoming commoditized? Yeah. Obviously, USP becomes more important in such a marketplace. Really yeah, you know, and, and, and thank you for asking the question. Uh, you know, there were a couple things that were probably overlapping in some of the content that we put in there. And one of them was the was the unique selling proposition. The other one was unique value proposition. Mm -hmm. Because about, about 10 years or so ago, I moved away from the unique selling proposition. Because to me, you know, selling a lot of times is telling, telling, telling. The yeah. value proposition is really an articulation of a benefit that may be a little bit different than selling. And there's actually, there's a template that we put inside there that people can go through that will say, okay, what is it that your marketplace wants? What is it that your marketplace needs? What, what, what? What uh, challenge does it solve? What benefit does it provide? And then how can you take that, um, you know, and put it into something that you can articulate either from, um, you know, from a marketing standpoint, from a selling standpoint, a communication standpoint, but also from an awareness standpoint. And so, uh, if you know, if they, if if whoever, um, you know, asked the question, if they would like me to help guide them through that process, there is a template that we put in there that will take you through that. Yeah, in fact, yeah, you do have the the USB template uh, in uh, that that wonderful. Uh, uh, giant enormous thud of stuff that spike provided with this package which man i, I hope everybody uh really appreciates uh, how much value there is there i mean this is stuff that was selling you know when you, you see a lot of these uh over inflated prices that people put on oh, we're you know we're only selling it for this much today and it's all bs this is stuff that you know was selling for those prices um all right let's move on to uh david david says is it possible to make b2b digital marketing in facebook in more traditional markets as fertilizers or countryside economy? Um, uh, if not, how can a digital marketing agency could reach a more traditional audience? Um, okay, so, sorry, I'm, I'm, uh, I don't think David, I don't think English is David's first language. <laughs> so, but um, I, I understand the question. Um, Spike, do you want to answer that or do you want me to go? Uh, well, you know, I'll, just, I'll just make one quick point, Mark, and you're much better qualified to answer it in depth than I. But, but I think, you know, one of the things with that is that you have to understand um, where, where people find information and, and where people actually make the decision to buy, right? So if you're in a, if you're in a rural economy and you're selling something that uh, is a physical product that has to be delivered within a five-mile radius, they yeah. may be searching for information. They may not be searching for the transaction. And so in some cases, it may not be practical to be a digital marketer, depending on the product or service and, um, that you're trying to provide to a particular market. Yeah. Yeah, right on. And by the way, I, I want to just uh, uh, say to David, uh, uh, I, I didn't mean anything personal there by poking fun at you. You know, the English is your second language. I think your Italian, looking at your name, um, and your English is way better than my Italian because uh, I, I I know a little classical Latin. I can read Italian, but I can't I can't speak it. I certainly could not formulate that question um, that you asked. Um, just to underscore what Spike is saying there, uh, he's totally right. Um, listen, everybody's online now, right? So just because the the business is not based online the people that you're talking to the people are right and so you can you can uh target those people in so many different ways on facebook on youtube um you know the best way to do it uh is to to get a list of customers and to upload it to facebook by the way a lot of folks don't know you can do this but you can upload lists to facebook and it's magic it's absolute magic so so think of this imagine you've got an email list and you can't email them anymore for whatever reason right? Well, you can still take that list and upload it to Facebook. They're going to attempt to match it to Facebook accounts. And then you can send messages directly to those folks. So if you could somehow get a list of people uh, in the fertilizer industry or whatever it is, um, and then upload them, them to Facebook, you're going to get direct, direct targeting uh, for these people, which is a beautiful thing. And by the way, that opens up a whole realm of possibilities. Um, some of them uh, gray hat, <laughs> right? So I'm going to kind of leave that there and, and leave that to your own imagination to uh, to figure out. And of course, I don't. I'm not encouraging you to go out there and break any rules. Um, although I would say that uh, you know one of the things that's kind of required, in my estimation, for uh, 
uh, success in business is to to see the rules as guidelines, <laughs> you know, not as not as hard and fast things that you got to follow all the time. All right, so David, I hope that uh, puts you in the right direction. If you need further clarification on that, we can go on to that too, guys. We've got ten more minutes here. I, you know, maybe we'll go a little bit longer. It's good. We'll, we'll see uh, how this goes, but I don't think we're going to get through all these. Um, Mark says, "Hey guys, I'm a little late. Thanks for doing this." How do you eliminate uh, too many viable directions effectively? I realize hacking and choosing one thing. However, uh, it's probably harder for some uh, uh, more than others. And then he, So he's got two more questions. Um, next, uh, knowing that the mental game is, uh, well, here, in fact, you know, why don't we take one of these, these one at a time here? Otherwise, it's going to get quite confusing. So um, we'll just restate that question. How do you eliminate too, uh, too many variables? Uh, viable directions effectively. I realize hacking and choosing one thing, however, it's probably harder for some more than others. Um, well, this is kind of what Simpleology does, uh, but I would love to hear what uh, what Spike has to say about this. Well, I, I'm, I'm going to give you credit for something, Mark. I, mean, I give you credit for many things because you, you <laughs> really are, you know, seriously, and I mean this in, in all sincerity, I mean, you know, you really are a mentor, a model, and and um, an example of a lot, of a lot of things. But, you know, I used to talk about um, high impact, um, and and what actually I, I used to talk about I used to talk about ease and opportunity, and you mm. came up with the timing thing, which is much better than mine. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so the high impact minimal effort, and 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 taking the spreadsheet that you have, right? You know, because I used to diagram it out for people and show them, you know, how they could they could evaluate different opportunities, figure out which ones they they should pursue and which mm. ones they should set aside, and being able to go through that exercise makes a difference. But let me just give you a real life tangible example. I think will will bring that home, but. But, but if you would, Mark, for my benefit as well, and I think for, for, the, for the question, if you could talk a little bit about the Jaime thing, I think it would help. But, you know, I used to work with a lot of uh, people who wanted to be authors. They wanted to get into the speaking business, wanted to get into seminars or whatever. And, and they would say, you know, um, you know, if, 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 you know, if only I could do this and if only I could do that. So I would use the example. I'd say, okay, look, let's, let's assume that you're an author. What is the one thing that could happen that would make all the difference in the world for you being an author? And they would say, well, I'd get Oprah to endorse my book. Right. And so, okay, great. So, like on a scale of one to ten, that's like a million, right? So, what are the odds of that happening? How long would it take for you to happen for that to happen? What's the probability? Well, like it's like point zero 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 zero, like a million one, right? So, all right. So, let, I'm not saying that you give up on your dreams, but let's figure out the things that can have a pretty big impact on your business, but have a high probability of success, and and can be done with with a reasonable amount of effort and be be realized in a relatively short period of time. So, you can use those quick wins. To kind of leverage yourself into some of the more strategic and some of the more uh, speculative opportunities that are out there. Wow, you know, I I just got to say one thing, and, and one thing that's really beautiful about meeting guys like Spike and Jay, and uh, you know, I've been able to to meet a lot of folks who were uh, sort of my heroes, you know, when I was younger, growing up, and then you know, some of these same folks get to be your friends. And one thing that that has struck me is that um, it, it's it's how similar the thinking is. Sometimes, you know, you, you meet people who are on similar paths and then independently you come to similar conclusions. What Spike is talking about is very, very similar to you know, what we talk about at Simpleology with Jaime. And, you know, I think what uh, Spike was asking me to, to elucidate there was the, the specific methodology that we have. So if you go inside Simpleology, you, there are uh, multiple lists uh, where you have a Jaime sorter and it's part of the start my day process. When you have whittled down your list of things that you're actually going to do today, we give you an opportunity to Jaime sort them. And then the mathematical formula is very simple. You, you rate them on a scale of one to 10 on impact and ease. So, you know, getting Oprah would be a 10, right? Um, you know, getting your grandma to, to post on, um, Amazon that she loved your book is probably a one, right? In terms of impact. Um, Maybe your grandma's famous. I don't know, right? But usually, yeah, probably at one. Grandma's Oprah. Yeah, yeah. Maybe your grandma's Oprah, right? <laughs> Who knows, right? And then ease t ten is going to be like, you know what? I I, I could uh, open up the the door of the fridge and it, it would it would be done. You know, that's 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 soup that easy, right? And a one would be it would be enormously hard. You know, it's a multi year project, that kind of thing. And you rate those things, and, and you do this. By the way, you just you kind of guess. I mean, it, you know, there's no precise thing here. But when you multiply those numbers together, and you give them a Jaime score, and then you rate all of your possible options by the total Jaime score. The stuff at the top of the list tends to be the most intelligent thing for you to do. Um, you know, I've, I've been doing this for uh, 15 years now, and uh, it, it's it's hard to break that system. Rarely has Jaime ever misguided me. And if it does, it's just a little bit off, right? It's because you, you didn't uh, rate things correctly. 
Um, and you, you can't always rate things correctly because you can't predict things perfectly. But it, in you know, in the the realm of possibilities, it gets you closer to where you need to go uh, than anything else. So, Mark, if you haven't uh, gone in there and used that yet, I strongly recommend that. Yeah, you know, and, and Mark, I mean, going through that exercise, you know, you know, you, sometimes you can take a subset, you know. So, like, you know, when, when mm. people have to say, okay, you know, if only I could get Oprah to endorse my book, I say, okay, well, look, you may not be able to get her to endorse your book, but is there someone in your local area, not your grandmother, but a radio, you know, someone who has a radio program, somebody who has a podcast, somebody who has a, a following online, and sometimes you know, taking those subsets, which may not be an Oprah, but which may be somebody who's um, has um, influence on a local basis. You can then use those things as leverage. So, you know, those things that are so big, uh, but maybe very, very difficult, doesn't mean you should never pursue them. Maybe put them off to the side and then come up with some subsets saying, okay, if I wanted to get to Oprah, what would I have to do? Well, I'd have to get someone locally to endorse me, and then maybe somebody regionally, then somebody nationally, maybe somebody she knows, maybe somebody that uh, she's featured before. And you can use those things as kind of stair steps in order to be able to get up to those bigger impact things that may seem difficult in the early days. That's a really beautiful way of looking at it. And by the way, how we would score that in Jaime would be, so, you know, maybe that guy that's a little less powerful than Oprah, maybe the ease of getting him is going to be so significantly higher that when you multiply it together, that might even give you a higher impact score than Oprah, right? Because Oprah is going to be a 10 and a one or a two, right? It's going to be usually a, a pretty hard thing unless you've got that kind of thing. And Spike is giving you a way to, to kind of leverage your way toward that. Um, Mark, I'm going to skip uh, your other two questions. I'm going to move on to some others because we've only got about five minutes here. But if we do have time, uh, I will I will scroll back down and get to those other questions that you had, sir. All right. So, um, okay, just uh, scrolling through some nice kind words here. Thank you guys for all these. Um, Garth says, what are some of your thoughts, insights on helping uh, local small businesses with online marketing, web design, hosting, SEO, social media, email, uh, et cetera. Well, you know, I think a few things. I mean, recognizing that, that, that most small businesses don't really uh, either understand what's out there, don't have the time, and really shouldn't be spending their time doing those types of things, right? Like if you're a barber trying to figure out how to go from knowing nothing about social media to becoming mediocre at it, doesn't allow you to make more money in your business, right? You know, you could have, you could have, um, uh, more people waiting in line to get their hair cut, but you don't, wouldn't have time to get it. So, so I think, you know, number one, being able to, to show a business owner how, uh, number one, what you do shortcuts it for them. Number two, the, the value and impact of, of what the potential would be of, 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 of working with you uh, in that. But, but, but probably just as importantly, and maybe even most importantly, is to, is to be able to show, to give them a metric and a measure saying, okay, look, Let's start this on a small, simple test, you know, very low cost, no cost, whatever it is that you want to do. And let's let's figure out what it is that we think we can get from an impact standpoint and what it would mean for your business. Right. And if we get this and we have this impact, what does it mean to you financially, strategically or whatever? And then being able to set it up, saying, OK, well, look, here's the metric. Here's what we expect. Be able, you know, put it in a situation that, you know, or feel very strongly that you can deliver that with an expectation that if you do it one month, you can do it on a long run basis, right? Because going out there trying to convince 100 businesses to engage you as a digital marketing resource or social media resource uh, and doing it uh, for a one-time transaction set up and going down the door, going down the street, knocking on another door, you know, you can spend a lot of time prospecting. But if you can get a dozen clients that, you know, they go through that test, they get the result and they, and they engage you and, and work with you on a monthly basis for a period of a year, two years, three years, four years, now you have a business, you don't have a promotion. And, and I think that's the key, you know, being able to get people to understand that as a small business owner, that, you know, they probably could figure it out on their own. And, and if everybody could figure out everything that they needed on their own, you wouldn't need Google, right? You could just go and you, you pull all this information yourself. But the, the ease and convenience and, and the access to that information, but also the application of that information, knowledge and expertise that drives us a, a particular result is really what businesses are willing to pay for. Beautiful. Let, let me give you one really interesting example I heard uh, very recently of a guy who was uh, pitching uh, uh, online marketing services to local businesses. And what this guy did was he went out and he got them ranked in Google. Um, you know, uh, he you know he would uh, connect them on like uh, Google Maps and you know do a lot of the really obvious stuff that people don't know how to do that the average guy just doesn't know how to do. And then he would call up the business a week later and say, Hey, have you noticed an uptick in your business within the last week? And they would say, you know what? I actually have, you know, and he would say, well, that's because of the stuff I did for you, <laughs> you know, and uh, let me, let me show you what I did and let me show you how that worked. Um, and, and if you like, if you appreciate that, and by the way, I just did that for you as a favor. Um, 
but you know, if you would like some other, here's some other things I can do. Um, and I can offer this stuff for you on a performance basis. Um, he just, he really made it a no brainer. It was like, he demonstrated the service and then he came in and said, and here's other stuff I can do. And by the way, there's no risk to you, right? You're going to pay me on a performance basis for this other stuff. Would you like me to get started? Right. Um, man, what an easy sale, what an easy sale to make. That's the way I would go about it. If I were, if I were doing that. You know, an effective demonstration is worth probably 10,000 words of copy, right? Hey, I'll tell you what, man, and, and they're so, so hard to come by. And this is why if you read Joe Sugarman's triggers, by the way, he says that the demonstration is the single most powerful thing there is in, in sales and marketing. Um, now, there are a lot of people say that X is the most powerful thing in sales and marketing. It's certainly one of the most powerful things. There's no doubt. I mean, uh, you know, that along with uh, time deadlines and, <laughs> and other things as well. Um, but uh, man, it's very, very hard to beat that. All right, guys, I think we have time for one more here. I'm going to take this one from uh, Eric, uh, Eric actually is one of the guys in uh, my cash injection boot camp and uh, ran the the first leg of Telman Knutson's Run Telman Run uh, campaign with me back in uh, in uh, when was that? God, that was around uh, 2007 or eight. And uh, 10, 10, 10, 11 years ago. 10, 11 years ago. Yeah, I uh, I ran uh, the first uh, half marathon I ever ran in my life. I ran barefoot through the streets of Manhattan with Telman Knudsen, uh, when he was, he was setting off to run, uh, across the country barefoot. And unfortunately, because he got an infection in his foot, he had to stop this wonderful campaign. Uh, but, uh, I did that. I, it was supposed to be Richard Branson actually running in my spot. And, uh, and I got to, to step in for Richard, which was kind of cool. Um, but anyway, Eric was there with me running, uh, and uh, Eric had his shoes on. I'm going to point out, Eric, do it barefoot next time, young man. Um, all right, I'm teasing him a little bit. All right, so Eric asks, I'm really intrigued by the Microsoft integration marketing story and realize there must be millions of companies that have products that don't know about each other that would totally work synchronistically together like a computer and an operating system. Indeed, I recently realized from providing massage uh, in the workplace for over 20 years, something that hasn't changed much over this time is that companies throw computers uh, on a desk and their employers or their employees try to work at these computers despite the difference in height and then maybe put a stand on the computer. Could you perhaps get computer uh, makers to offer stands or coupons for stands with their computers? So how to connect these companies together, uh, et cetera. Uh, I, I have some thoughts. Go ahead, Spike. Well, well the, simple, the simple answer is yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> If, 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 if there's if there's a need if there's if there's a value, um, you know companies will say yes. Whether it's whether it's the the supplier, the you know, the vendor, or whatever. Um, but 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 you know I think you know, part of that goes back to number one. You know if you could find someone to do that, do you have the ability to bridge that? Right. The thing that Mark, Microsoft was able to do is that okay, we have an operating system that we can plug into a computer. So when you buy a computer, you have the operating system. So they had the vehicle to do that. Now if they went to uh, someone in um, uh, Des Moines, Iowa, in 1982, who didn't have access to the internet, and they said, "Okay, great, you know, uh, we're going to give you an operating system." Uh, what do you mean you don't have a computer? You don't want a computer? But hey, we got a great operating system. The bottom line is, it would have been very, very successful. So, you know, if you were going to do something like that, number one, you know, figure out, you know, how can you do it on scale, right? Trying to sell one chair at a time or one customized desk at a time may work um, to some degree, but it would be it would be a very costly exercise, and you and you would have to you'd have to spend a lot of money. But maybe what you could do is, since people already have computers and they already have a desk, that maybe you could uh, create an application that would allow them to sit at their chair and look at their computer, and then through the app, they could, through the camera, they could actually see the optimum height uh, of the chair in order to be most ergonomically correct and effective so that someone who ran a corporation would say, hey, you know what, we don't want back problems. We want to make sure that all of our employees you know, go through this exercise to make sure they have the perfect office set up. I mean, there's lots of ways to do it. But you have to figure out a way to try to appeal to the market, I think, in mass. And then you can figure out how you can put the pieces together. Beautiful. Um, I don't have too much to add to that because I really think you nailed it. Um, you know, all I would say is, is uh, Eric, uh, you know, knowing you as I do, um, what I would tell you is just get out there and do it. Um, it. You know, do as many of these pitches as you possibly can. Um, start out with some smaller guys to, to, to refine and hone that pitch over time and then to keep scaling that up. Because remember one of these deals can change your life, right? It's worth spending some time every day to go out there and do that. Um, hone that pitch the way Spike was talking about there 
and then get out, but don't spend too much time doing it. Right. And, you know, get it, get a decent version of that pitch and then find out from the people that you're sending this pitch to why they're not responding. If they're not right, maybe you'll get it right, right out of the gate. Most of us don't. Right. So expect some no's, but then ask them, you know, don't be afraid to say, Hey, um, you know, no, no pressure. Uh, you know, but, uh, if you got a moment to explain to me, um, why you said no to help me out, um, would you let me know, you know, asking questions like that are surprisingly powerful ways of ferreting out what's actually going on. And sometimes it gives you a second opportunity to save the deal because then you can say, Oh, well, actually we can do that. By the way, if we were to do that for you, would you say yes? And yeah. sometimes they'll say yes. Well, you know, Mark, I mean, and, and this, you know, can come across, I think, sometimes as being too too abrupt or too slick. But but I think if, if you say it with sincerity and you say it with genuine interest, mm. it goes a long way. And, and the question that, you know, I used to share with people to ask and sometimes that I would I would ask as well is that, okay, I understood that this isn't a fit for you, but what would it what would it have taken for in order for you to have said yes? Beautifully stated. You know, people tell you like, wow, you know what, the price was too high. I didn't understand this, and only you know, it's like, okay, great. Now you can go right back into the buying trees and kind of thing. Oh, well, I should have told you this kind of thing, <laughs> and insert yourself, you know, and, and however you do it. But it, but I think you know the, the key is is that you know it, it really needs to be sincere and it really needs to be one of genuine uh, interest. And and if you and if you can fix it, great. If you can if you can provide it, fantastic. But even if you can't, you know what it is that um, that you need to do differently, or what it is that you can either access or provide that you don't have currently. And, and by being able to gather that information, whether it's your product, whether it's your service, or whether you all of a sudden you have a bunch of unconverted leads that you could offer to somebody else, right? You know, speaking of Jay, I mean, that's one of the things that Jay used to teach, and I think he used to do quite well, is that he would go to somebody who had a bunch of unconverted leads that didn't buy their product and say, well, look, how about if I took that database and uh, and I marketed that database and I gave you a percentage of whatever it is that I sold to that database, because these are people that you can't sell to anyway, right? So you'd find a product that, that filled the gap that they couldn't, and then it became a revenue stream for them as opposed to just a dead database. Beautiful, beautiful. And uh, man, th this is the kind of stuff that I love hearing about Jay doing, right? Because Jay was, well, I should say was, I'm, I'm speaking of him as if he's not around. He still is. Uh, you know, th this is the kind of thing that he does. And he's so wonderful at seeing opportunity where a lot of folks don't see it. Um, one other last thing I'll, I'll add to that is that uh, another thing that you get from that kind of question, and by the way, the, the way that Spike phrased it is, is way better uh, than what I phrased. Um, it, one other thing you can get from those questions is that you get ammunition for neutralizing objections in the future, right? So let's say perhaps if somebody gives you that objection, the reason they can't uh, buy today or they won't buy today, let's say you can't, there's no way you could address it. You know, for example, what if they said the price is too high and the price that you're offering is, is you, you, you can't really lower it and have decent profit margins. Well, what can you do? Um, well, I mean, you could, you know, perhaps offer it as a loss leader, right? And then, uh, you know, establish that relationship for the long term, which is often always a very, very good idea. Um, or you can just, you know, tuck that in your back pocket and remember for the next presentation, okay, th this is a potential objection. It's one of the common ones. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to inoculate my prospect by neutralizing the objection through persuasion, right? You know, for example, if it's price, you know, you can talk about price, you know, and, and, and talk about how, you know, the, the lower end ones don't last very long, right? You know, the quality is not very good. You know, you get what you pay for, as you know, you know, that kind of language can really get that person to accept that, uh, you know, the, the, the higher price is worth it. Another thing you can do, of course, is comparison and contrast, right? Um, you know, a thousand dollars doesn't seem like much when you've been talking about twenty thousand dollars for the last, you know, couple hours, right? Mm -hmm. But a thousand dollars seems like a lot if you've been talking about, you know, uh, uh, nickels and dimes, right? So uh, all of these things definitely uh, uh, are useful. All right, I think this is a really good. Oh, go ahead, Spike. Can I just add one other one thing? You yeah. Know, the, the most difficult objection is the unspoken objection, right? Because yes. You don't, you, don't, you don't know the reason why people said no, but but, but you know. Um, when, when I look at copy, I mean, and, th and this just tickles the crap out of me when I see this, when, when someone is writing a piece of copy and they write down the four or five objections that people might have, even if they didn't have them, right, and then they come up with a way to address those objections before people have them, it does a couple things. I mean, obviously, it takes the big objections away and it's also an advanced, like a pre-disclosure thing. But the other thing that it does unconsciously, I think, and maybe even consciously, is that it allows the prospect or the buyer of the market to know that, number one, you really understand them, and number two, you really care enough to, you know, to try to think about what it is that they're thinking about and being able to address the things that are concerns to them. And I think it, what it does is that it creates an unconscious bind 
that, that allows you to advance the element of trust so that when you do get to the transactional portion of it, you're not just telling someone something, you're actually basically giving them something that they've already thought about that has already addressed the concerns that they had previously. Mm, very, very good distinction. Okay, guys, I want to leave everybody on one uh, thought here. Um, and that is a uh, uh, an ugly truth of the information marketing industry. And the ugly truth is that uh, most people who buy information products don't actually use them. It's it's I know it's a shock. It's a shock, but they don't. <laughs> and uh, here's the thing. So of all the people who bought this, uh, I, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but it's a pretty uh, sizable uh, number. Uh, there is a, a fraction of that number that actually showed up for the call today. And what I will tell you is that an even smaller fraction are actually going to go in and read the materials that Spike created. Okay, now let me tell you what a tragedy that is. Um, well, I don't even have to tell you because you've actually been demonstrated that by watching this video. You know, I, I think you're getting a sense now for the, the depth of what Spike knows, how battle-hardened his ideas are. Um, when you realize that, when you realize that he can shave off potentially decades off your learning curve in the errors that you are probably going to make in building your business. And I'm not saying that to disparage you. I'm saying that because you're a human being in business and, uh, we almost all make these same mistakes. Um, I hope that this is a call for you to really get in there and dig into that stuff that Spike provided because it is all super worthwhile. Uh, I've gone through all of it. Um, I mean, I had to, you know, in, in preparing uh, this whole thing, but then even afterwards, I, I look back and I made notes like, oh man, go back and look at this because I have templates and things that I use and I'm constantly refining them. And I was like, oh man, like that way that Spike phrased that question, you know, was so much better than the way I phrased it. I, I'm not going to let my ego tell me, oh no, no, that's not your way. No, man, the, the, the right way is the right way. The better way is the better way. If your ego gets in the way of that, you're in serious trouble in your business, by the way. So um, with that said, uh, I would just encourage everybody to do it. I've got a question there. Where are the materials? Preston, uh, in you should have received an email uh, when you purchased the package. Uh, and if you can't locate that, just uh, send an email to support at simpleology.com, support at simpleology.com. Those guys are standing by 24 seven. They would be delighted to point out to you exactly where all those things are uh, and other things as well. Um, and I encourage you guys to dig into your simpleology and get your simpleology black belt guys. If you don't have your simpleology black belt yet, you're wrong. <laughs> I'm just telling you right now, it's the best thing you can do for your business on multiple, multiple levels. You get your Simpleology Black Belt, get all of your employees your Simpleology Black Belt, get your kids their Simpleology Black Belts because they're going to be better kids, better students. They're going to they're gonna be more organized. They're going to be less in your hair. Not that I have that problem. I don't have hair or kids, but, but if I had hair and I had kids, I'd want them all to be Simpleology Black Belts. All right, guys, that is it for today. Spike, thank you so much for, for spending this time, man. It's always a pleasure hanging out with you. Yeah, thank you. All right, guys, y'all have a wonderful day.